Welcome to Inside Hawaii Real Estate, a show dedicated to providing up-to-date information news to Hawaii home buyers, homeowners, and investors. I'm Will Tanaka with my co-host, business partner, and wife, Leonie Lam, a realtor with over 20 years of experience in various leadership roles in the Hawaii real estate industry. Thanks, Will. Will is a full-time realtor with a background as a lawyer, and he was the former head of the Hawaii Title and Escrow Company, and we work as a team to keep you informed about the latest in Hawaii real estate. And did you know that over the last four decades, our guest today, Mitch Imanaka, has done significant work. He is considered to be an iconic real estate attorney, and he also happens to be an amazing person, husband and father to two very successful sons. And our focus today is going to be talking with Mitch Imanaka about affordable housing in Hawaii. Welcome, Mitch. Hi, Leonie. Hi, Will. Hi. Good to see you guys. Yeah, welcome, Mitch. And you know, what an honor. And we're so grateful to have you on our show. Because when it comes to real estate law, I mean, you have the highest regard by attorneys, clients, and the public. But, you know, for the viewers who are just getting to know Mitch, you know, he obtained his law degree from the Georgetown University Law Center. He's a co-editor of Hawaii Real Estate Law Manual. And I still refer to that manual. So thank you, Mitch. And, you know, when you think about the go-to attorney, the expert attorney, the lawyer for condo development, timeshares, and affordable housing, Mitch Imanaka. And, you know, not only is he a recognized leader in Hawaii real estate law, but he's nationwide. His company and he himself uh, won the Member Company of the Year by NIOC, the National Commercial and Real Estate Development Association. And you know what? I think you're just global, Mitch, because, you know, you have clients Hilton, Marriott, so you're just international. And, you know, add to that, Mitch has also been a Hawaii real estate commissioner and an adjunct professor at the UH Richardson School of Law. And he has been an advisor to the state of Hawaii on matters with subdivisions and timeshares. And so regarding affordable housing, Mitch, you reminded us that the issue of not having enough affordable housing in Hawaii has been an issue for many, many decades. And we hear about it on the news. And I remember Ian Tangi even said in American Idol that his family had to move to the mainland because they were priced out of paradise. And so Mitch, you've made significant impacts in supporting real estate developers, which are vital to increasing our supply because they build the affordable housing. And just wondering if you could please Tell us more about your work in this area. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks very much to both of you for that very generous introduction. Um, uh, I really appreciate it. Um, affordable housing is, as you point out, Leone, is not a new issue in Hawaii. I, I can remember way back in the 80s, I think it was 1988, um, there was a mayoral campaign going on. And I was on a panel with, um, I think it was, um, let's see, Patsy Mink and uh, Marilyn Bornhorst and Dennis O'Connor and a few other people. And the subject of the day was, guess what? Affordable housing. So it's been a huge issue here in Hawaii for many, many years, as, as long as I can remember. Um, and it's an issue that persists and has reached uh, a critical juncture, I think, right now in, in our state. Um, how I was involved uh, initially in the early 90s, I had the privilege of representing a company by the name of Nanse. They had purchased large parcels of land on the big island of Hawaii. And that was in 1992. Um, and guess what happened? They had big plans, but the Iraq war happened. And so there was no market for market rate units at that time. Everybody was you know, very concerned about what was going to happen. And so they pivoted to do affordable housing to fulfill their entitlement requirements. So I was retained as counsel for them to help them through two large projects. I, I think we produced maybe four or 500 units in Waikoloa and in Kauai High um, using tax credits. So that was the first exposure to affordable housing in a meaningful way way back then. Uh, flash forward to today, 
uh, the firm was very fortunate in representing Sam Ku on the very first uh, affordable 201H high-rise project uh, on Kapiolani Boulevard called Kapiolani Residences. So it's been a long journey, a lot learned in between. Um, and I think we're in a much better place today than we were back then, at least in terms of what the requirements are. That's great. And, you know, thank you for sharing us the history because, yeah, I mean, affordable housing, you know, with the, the governor and it, it's always a hot topic. And, you know, let's talk about the median sales price on Oahu. Because, you know, for condos over 500,000, median sales price for single family homes over a million. And in terms of, um, I mean, how, how serious is the housing crisis right now and how many units, you know, are needed? I think we have a slide for that as well. Yeah, I don't think it's any secret that, you know, we, we have a crisis. Um, it's all over the media. Everybody's talking about it. And, and a lot of good people are trying to put their thinking, thinking caps on to try to figure out a good solution. Um, I think a, a study done by DBED a few years ago uh, said that we need as many as 26,000 rental units and 10,000 for sale units by 2025. And everybody has their own numbers. Uh, this is uh, a study that was done by uh, SMS for DBED at the time. But uh, that, that's a huge number of units. Um, I know that we've chipped away at that since 2020 and since the study was done, but we're still um, short of that number. We have a couple of years to go. Um, we'll see if we hit it. Do you think that that number is still sort of, I mean, I'm sure it's valid, but, you know, because there's so many people leaving Hawaii, like it was reported 15,000 people left Hawaii to move to somewhere that's more affordable just last year. So do you think that that number is still accurate today? That's a very good question, Leone. And uh, yes, I do. For the reason that the demand is so high, um, it would take a, a, a much larger number of people leaving uh, to leave us with enough housing for our people. So yes, it's a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we're talking about affordable housing and there's so much information out there, and even for me, sometimes it could be overwhelming. And we hear a lot about the term AMI, area medium income, as one of the eligibilities for uh, affordable income and or affordable housing. Um, can you kind of unpack that a little bit for us and, you know, why it's important for families who are applying for affordable homes in Hawaii? Sure. Well, that's a great question. Um, area median income is simply put, uh, the, the income that a person or a group of people in, in a family make in any given year. And half of the people in Hawaii that are working, I suppose, make less than that, and the other half make more than that. Mm -hmm. So for a single individual, um, the AMI for Honolulu and each county is different. The federal government does this, the uh, Housing and Urban Development uh, does this and gives this and publishes it. Uh, for Honolulu, the AMI or area median income for a single person is about $113,000. What you see on your screen there is 140% of AMI, which is the maximum amount that someone can earn, a single individual can earn um, under guidelines um, published by uh, HHFDC, which is the Hawaii Housing and Finance Development Corporation. So um, that is the, number that they use as a maximum amount for a lot of their projects that they approve in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I see. So for example, just going back to that slide, if it's, you know, one person, uh, one individual making, so they could make up to $128,000 a year and still qualify for a affordable housing potential. That's correct. And I think that that's 2022 numbers. So it might be a little higher this year. 2023. Uh -huh. So then in terms of, you know, because it's um, above the median, and then of course, you know, we're, uh, there's a, a lower threshold, 
maybe 50 to 60,000. Um, you know, there's a lot of families with children that probably that make that much total in order to afford. And, you know, that's always been a dilemma um, because you have to be in a certain price range because you also have to be able to afford the mortgage. So how do you, um, how, how does the government and the developers, how, how do you balance that out? Well, that's, a, that's another good question. So there are people um, more qualified than me to, to tell you how that calculation is done. But the, the uh, AMI is just, just a touchstone to tell you uh, how much, up to how much you can earn in order to qualify for different levels of uh, housing products. And, and so one interesting thing that your viewers uh, should know is that the increase in interest rates, um, there's an inverse relationship between the increase in interest rates and the uh, likely targeted um, amount that someone can pay for quote unquote affordable housing. So every time the rates go up, uh, the um, purchase price, if you will, for an affordable unit actually goes down. And so that's something to keep in mind, you know, in, in a high interest rate environment um, or higher, now we're experiencing that right now, you know, uh, that uh, what that means is that the amount of um, someone can sell the unit at is actually at a lower price level. Um, and I, I can't get into the details, it's, it's very complex. But there are tables that are published, you know, that will tell you precisely how much, given what the AMI requirement is at a different interest rate, you can charge for um, an affordable unit. Um, the federal government publishes that every year. Huh. And then I guess, you know, for the affordable housing, there's requirements that are involved in being able to qualify for an affordable housing unit. And then maybe you can kind of walk us through some of those requirements. Like, for example, do they have to be a first-time homebuyer to qualify for an affordable unit? Yeah, that's another good question. There are lots of requirements that um, government uses to qualify people. Um, but being a first-time homebuyer is not one of those. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't have to be a first-time homebuyer. Um, you cannot currently own other real estate that's a dwelling unit um, as an example um, and i think for the city's purposes and each governmental entity has its own specific requirements by the way so at the city level um, you cannot have owned real estate in the prior in the three years prior to your application that's one of their qualifying uh, requirements but yeah if you put the others up you know, you have to be a Hawaii resident. Um, let's see. Let's see. Yeah. U.S. citizen or permanent resident alien, 18 years of age. Um, yeah. You need to physically reside in the unit and obviously have enough income to qualify. And then, you know, um, in those situations, let's say that they're somewhere within the AM AMI but they can't afford to get that mortgage, can family members help out and still qualify um, if they can't qualify on their own? Family members often do um, get involved. Um, as an example, you know, there may be a down payment requirement for the acquisition of the unit and they're able to gift uh, a down payment. That's just one example of how a family member can help another acquire a unit, assuming that they don't have the down payment to acquire it. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then, so when people are applying to buy these affordable units, um, it's really, I think the programs are in place so that they're able to get into the housing game, right? At a, at a maybe at a price that's more affordable. So the question kind of, goes towards, um, I've heard of a, of a lot of these affordable units or projects having shared appreciation. And so 
I was wondering if you could kind of explain to us what is shared appreciation and, and do you think that's that's a good thing, you know? Yeah, that's another good, you're asking great questions, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, shared appreciation is, uh, can be defined as uh, the government entity sharing in any appreciation that occurs after someone acquires a unit um, in that unit. So, um, and, and I think to your last question, I think it's very fair because um, the buyer of that unit um, is actually buying that unit at a price that is below market rate, okay? So, you know, the, the uh, government entity, whether it's HHGFDC or HF, um, HCDA or the city, you know, should share in any appreciation that occurs because um, they're subsidizing the acquisition. So they have an investment in that unit, if you will, that you're buying. So as an example, you know, if someone is buying a unit, say at a $500,000 level, and the market value of that unit when they acquire it is actually 600,000. Uh, mm -hmm. Government is subsidizing $100,000 of that purchase by that particular buyer. Um, and <clears throat> how shared appreciation works is you take the market value mm -hmm. and you subtract the purchase price of the unit um, and you divide it by the purchase price, the, the base price of that unit. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you come up with a fraction that's applied against um, any gain that's realized on the sale of the unit. So as an example, 600,000 and the original price was 500,000 that you bought it at. And the base price, let's say it's 500,000 just for calculation purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes out to one fifth so upon a sale of the property, you know, um, if they're they're selling it um, at, at a million dollars or whatever it is, and and you you gain half half a million dollars, you know, one fifth of that goes back to the government, um, and it's a good thing because the, the government uses that money to plow right back into creating more affordable housing. So. Um, you know, I, I think it, it works, you know, from just a, a, a logic standpoint, and it certainly helps, and it will help even more because there's a lot of affordable housing now being built in certain areas of Honolulu, as an example. And when those start to sell uh, and a shared appreciation kicks in, you're gonna have more funds flow into the funds that are available to build more affordable housing. So it's kind of creating like the sustainable sort of system and it Correct. just kind of re-effuses every time so that it can create more opportunities for other people. That's the concept basically. That's right. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. okay. And then so so for shared appreciation, that never goes away. That never expires, even if the homeowners are in there for like 20 years, right? Right. Okay. And then just kind of along the same lines, there's like a buyback provision where um, you know, applicants or homeowners for affordable housing, they have to stay in for a certain amount of time between, I've heard anywhere from two to 10 years possibly. Yes, um, different agencies, again, HCDA has two, five and 10 year restrictions and HHFDC has 10 year, 10 year restriction. The city has their own chart. So depending on how long um, you commit the unit for in terms of affordable housing, you know, um, it, it just depends on, on how long that obligation is on that it's tied to the percentage of units that are created at any particular project. But um, yeah, that's kind of how that works. And, and so if there is a sale or if someone wants to sell the unit or dispose of it in some way, then the governmental entity uh, will usually have uh, a right of first refusal, if you will. They have the right to purchase it you know, from that buyer. Um, and if not, in some cases, a nonprofit entity will have that opportunity um, 
So, you know, that's another way that government protects that unit from going or uh, becoming a market rate unit, if you will. Yeah. I see. Okay. So, you know, just to com combine the two uh, topics about shared appreciation and the buyback provisions. So, let's say there was a 10 year buyback hold, and in five years, in your example, you know, they bought it at 500,000 balloon to a million dollars but they're selling it year five. They still have five years remaining. So they can't try to, um, you know, uh, take advantage of that game. They would have to sell it back at a, at what they bought it for, or at least, you know, um, just so that they can't um, take advantage of the huge gain that they would otherwise have. I, th I think it's that plus the any uh, the value of any improvements plus I think it's one percent a year, um, you know, and, and you got to do that calculation to figure out what that amount is. Um, yeah, learning so much here, Mitch. <laughs> and then you know, switching gears to developers. So you you know, there's definitely a pressing demand for affordable housing in Hawaii. And of course, we need the active participation of the develop developers. So beyond you know the that philanthropic perspective, uh, what kind of incentives um, encourages developers to help engage in construction of affordable homes? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, uh, developers are always engrossed as they should be in their pro formas, you know, it's all about making the numbers work and pencil, because if it doesn't, if they, if, if they cannot, uh, if they're going to lose money when they build something, um, they might want to do it themselves, by the way, but no one else is going to let them do it because they're not going to be able to convince a lender to give them money unless they're actually making some money on the deal. Uh, it's just a, too risky uh, for the, the banks to finance that because the banks are not, uh, although the banks are highly philanthropic in our community, uh, they're not philanthropic to that degree where they will, they will give money to build affordable housing. So and ultimately, you know, it's really the lender's um, money that's uh, on the line at risk as well as the, equi the developer's equity, if any. Uh, but yeah, th so that's, uh, you, you really need to make sure that the numbers work. So mm -hmm. bottom line, you know, there are opportunities and um, Hawaii Revised Statutes Chapter 201H um, gives government a great opportunity to lift some of the heavy, financial burdens that a developer faces in trying to make the numbers work. As an example, you know, there's there are opportunities to lift parking requirements um, at, you know, uh, creating parking stalls is a huge financial obligation. There are opportunities to increase density, to increase height, you know, to enable the developer to create more units. Uh, perhaps um, encroach on certain setback requirements um, to gain the advantage of not paying the general excise tax, which is huge, especially on Oahu at four, you know, four point six, whatever that number is, percent. And by the way, that flows through all the way to all the consultants working on the project, so that can make a huge financial difference. Um, you know, in terms of whether someone can make a, a project financially viable and therefore financeable. Yeah. Because under 201H, so I hear the different percentages, like, you know, when you're constructing a, even a condo development, for example, maybe 20% of the units are required to be affordable housing up to 50%. Yeah. So under 201H, um, you need to build well, 50% plus one of all of the units in the project have to be affordable. Mm. Um, and that would be up to 140% of AMI or below. 
Um, and with regard to city requirements, if you're doing a city project, um, it, you know, um, it, you don't have the benefit of 201H unless you specifically apply to, to get that uh, designation from HHFDC. But the city's affordable requirement and touchstone is 100, up to 120% of EMI. So. Wow. And, and, you know, as we're kind of winding down, I, I wanted to quickly just touch upon the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, if that's okay. Yeah. So I know they give, you know, uh, direct benefits to Native Hawaiians by providing 99-year leases, homestead leases for a dollar per year. And, but, you know, there's a long waiting line or wait, waiting list and land is limited. Uh, what other affordable housing opportunities does uh, THHL provide for Native Hawaiians? That's been in the media quite a lot recently because uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, DHHL, uh, is getting $600 million um, to expand on affordable housing and creating affordable housing. So um, it, it, it could, if it's handled properly, uh, take a lot of beneficiaries off the list. I think there are about 29,000 beneficiaries on the list right now. And uh, the new director, Kali Watson, um, is very excited about the opportunity to, you know, reduce that number, obviously. Uh, one opportunity I know that the director is currently looking at is a, a rent-to-own um, option where traditionally under DHHL leases, it's just all about rental. And at the end of the term, you have to give back the property, basically. Um, under this new model, specifically for um, you know, condo projects, um, as an example, um, at the end of the term, the tenant would have the opportunity to acquire the unit as an owner. So they would actually have equity in the property going forward. So the details have to be worked out, but I understand the department is moving in that direction. And I think it creates a great opportunity for people who qualify as beneficiaries um, to, to create equity that they wouldn't otherwise have um, if they were mere renters under a 99-year lease. Yeah. Mm. So it's an exciting um, new thought that uh, Director Watson is looking at very seriously. Yeah. No, I think that's great. And um, I feel like this could be a whole series, Mitch, because I mean, We've learned so much already, you know, within this half an hour. And I mean, I feel like there's so much more to talk about. So in terms of, um, I mean, how do people reach you, first of all, if they could reach you directly or, you know, through someone else? And what would be like the last message that you want to leave for our viewers? Thanks. Um, well, you know, today with Google and everything, just Google and you'll find me. <laughs> You know, I'm always reachable and available. But um, a message, I guess, is let's not give up hope as a community. Um, you know, we have the smarts to do it. We have now the political will to do it, I think. Um, and we have the financial resources to do it. And we have good people, you know, trying to solve for this vexing issue. So let's give it a chance and let's work hard toward that end. You know, it's always discouraging to me when I hear negative comments about what's going on or why we can't do something. I think as a community, we really need to say, hey, we can, you know, can, we can do it. And let's get our minds around that and move forward. So anyway, just my two cents. Well, I think you've exemplified the can because of all of the hard work that you've done. And we're just so grateful for you and for the time that you spent with us. And I do agree with Will that this could be an entire series. So hopefully you'll join us again soon. <laughs> well, thanks, Will and Leonie. It was a lot of fun. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mitch. Really appreciate you. Okay. Thank you, Mitch. Aloha. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.